your primary vehicle, we would be very, very limited as human beings on our development and what we can do and how we can be able to explore and cover our world. When the French arrived here in, uh, in North America, uh, they relied very, very, very heavily on indigenous guides, indigenous knowledge to be able to, and technology to be able to survive. Because what could be applied in an agricultural farming-based world in a heavily developed Europe didn't apply here in North America. Modern canoes paddle across a lake shore. In our modern world, we think about canoes as a recreational thing. You know, we take a canoe out to enjoy the river and to see nature. We take a canoe out um, as something that is fun. We take a canoe out to fish. Um, and certainly indigenous people here in this area use canoes for fishing, but we have to understand they're a vehicle. It's the way to be able to get around and to travel was canoes. The rivers were the highway system. There was a broad, broad amount of trade. People traded uh, all kinds of things. We know that um, copper from you know, Lake Superior in this region, just north of us, made it all the way to the northwest coast, all the way to the, what is now the southwest United States to Central America. Central American trade goods made it here. Obsidian from the Rocky Mountains. All of this was carried in canoes. Traditional Jimon can be made from many different kinds of trees, including white pine, birch, and elm trees. Birch bark canoes were common among Native American tribes of the Northern Great Lakes region. However, south of the birch line, Native tribes relied on other types of trees like elm to build canoes. Elm trees are scarce today due to diseases, but were once commonly used in the Great Lakes to build canoes, baskets, utensils, and other items. Trees have certain characteristics of things that they're good at. They're just like people, they have gifts. Each and every person has gifts of things that they're really, really good for. And one of the things that the elm is um, really good for is the bark. The American elm is a tree which has a bark that slips off really easy in the spring. It's really flexible. The inner bark feels like leather. It's pliable. And when it dries, it's incredibly strong. Part of why it's strong is because it's tough to tear it. The bark, the fibers are crisscrossed and overlaid like this, like they're woven. And that makes them incredibly, incredibly tough. You can make baskets that are so strong you can stand on them. You can put them on a house, on a lodge or a wigwam and use them for your roof and your walls. You can walk on top of that, that elm bark lodge. That's how tough it is. So it's really good for making canoes. And there are other trees that were used by Anishinaabe people and by Wyandotte people and, and other indigenous people in the Great Lakes for making canoes, but they all have those characteristics. In southern Michigan, American elm was the favorite for bark canoes. In the north, birch bark is even better because birch bark, it burns like petroleum, but it's totally waterproof it's, and it's super lightweight. It's antifungal and antibacterial, so it doesn't rot. So a birch bark canoe is incredibly lightweight. It's very, very easy to carry. It handles really well in the water. You can make it into any design you want, but it doesn't grow here. So it was traded and brought for, by people from the north down to this area, but the elm canoes were made right around here. So people made elm bark canoes oftentimes as temporary craft around here. So if you wanted to get to some place and you didn't have a canoe, you could make an elm bark canoe. And you can make it in a pretty short amount of time. Today, the art of building an elm bark canoe is almost lost. But many citizens of Great Lakes nations are now focused on rekindling traditional knowledge and handing it down to the next generation. Based in Wayland, Michigan, citizens of the Machabanashawish Band of Potawatomi Indians, or Gun Lake Band, along with citizens of five other Great Lakes tribal nations, historians, and National Park volunteers came together to build River Raisin National Battlefield Park an elm bark canoe. A very rare vessel today, this elm bark canoe will be the first of its kind built and steered by descendants of these tribal nations in over a century. Splitting cedar wood. Before construction of the elm bark canoe can begin, other natural resources are harvested and prepared for use in the canoe building process. 
Cedar trees are used in multiple ways by Anishinaabe people and are an important native plant in the Great Lakes. For the canoe, cedar trees are harvested, cut, and then split. It's an evergreen tree. Um, it grows in the swampy areas. Um, that tree is the one that keeps a lot of our animals warm in the winter times. It feeds a lot of our animals too in the winter times. It's a real lightweight wood. It splits very, very clean. So we harvested two cedar trees and to make the ribs and the sheathing. The ribs are the, the waganug, the, the bent pieces, much like our ribs in our rib cage, which give the strength to the body of the canoe. And then there's uh, what we call a pizadaganug, which is uh, sheathing. And it's like this paper thin layer that goes in and rests between the bark and the ribs. It helps distribute the pressure that the ribs are putting on the canoe. And that adds additional strength. So if you picture your body, you have layers. You have skin. Underneath the skin is the muscle. The muscle goes the opposite way of the ribs. And then you have the ribs that add the strength. So that's the same way as a, a, a canoe is, whether it's a birch bark canoe or an elm bark canoe. The bark is the skin. The sheathing, um, fine wooden sheathing, is like the muscle that adds the, the flexibility to it. And then the ribs are the, the strength of the canoe. We harvested the cedar and we split that down um, into rough, big rough splits um, out in the woods. And then we began splitting it into finer and finer pieces, flat pieces. And the splitting is really important. We could cut it with a saw, but it wouldn't be as good because when you split it by hand, it naturally splits on the growth rings. So if we think about the biology of how a tree grows, every year the tree grows a new ring. If you cut a tree down and you look at the stump, you can count from the very center of these little concentric circles and count how many circles out. And if there's 67, it's 67 years. And so when we split that up, we're splitting it into flat pieces. And if you look at the end of that little flat board, you'll see that there's layers. And we can see that how many rings those are. We can actually count them. They're about four growth rings thick. So those ribs uh, all follow the growth rings. It lasts a long time. And, and um, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty durable, too. It, it flexes and bends well. And that's why the tree is really strong. So you can see the flexibility but the strength, that's really critical. And then we use a, a, a tool called a crooked knife in English. We call it a wagkoman in Anishinaabe, which is a, a Anishinaabe knife. It's de designed um, for general carving. It has a, um, a curved handle on it. You place it in your hand and uh, it's ergonomic. It has a piece that sticks out that you put your thumb on. Kevin shapes wood with a crooked knife. Now, wagkoman, this tool here, is incredibly sharp. When I hold it in my hand, when I'm pulling backwards towards my body, I have more strength than if I was taking a knife and pushing away, and more control. And it, it's nice because it has a flat part of the blade for I'm looking for a couple of things. The biggest thing is 
straight. Like this tree is really straight for a long ways up. So he'll make a he'll make a good one for our uh, top of our canoe. It's also going to be the cross pieces of the canoe, what we call our thwarts, or the supports that go across the, the top or our grab handle. It's very strong, but it splits really nice and it carves nice, So and it bends well. We can bend it in all kinds of shapes and it'll dry to that shape. And that's why it's good for um, canoe parts. The group knocks down a hickory tree. That's what they One tree, we split it in half. We're going to split it into quarters. So if you picture a pie, there's half cuts and then there's quarter cuts. So we're going to take the quarter cuts and those are going to be um, nice long pieces. We want to get them as straight and even as possible so that we can have two pieces of wood on the outside of the canoe and two pieces of wood on the inside of the canoe. But we have to be really careful because sometimes the, the tree wants to split one way or another and we have to use a hatchet to get in front of it to direct the split. Um, because, you know, it's different than making a board. If we had a lumber mill, we could just run a saw blade right down the middle of it. But we're using a hatchet and we're following what the tree wants to do. So it's kind of a, a relationship between us and the tree to make the piece of wood into what we want it to be. We have a, a steel hatchet and then uh, we use a, a wooden, basically a wooden mallet, um, which is, uh, which we make these out of ironwood. Ironwood is a type of tree which is really tough. This one's lasted us about three, four years and it's smashed lots of stuff. And <clears throat> there's still a little life left in it, but it weighs a lot. And we use this to hit the hatchet. So the hatchet actually is working like a wedge and we don't want to hit the hatchet with a steel piece because it would it would like smash up Mushing the back it of, yeah it would smash up the back of the hatchet we don't want to do that to find a
We need to waterproof our canoe. The big thing that we have to do with any bark canoe, an elm bark canoe or a birch bark canoe or a, a hickory bark canoe, a basswood bark canoe, spruce bark canoe, all bark canoes have pitch. A natural patching material must be made to seal the cracks and the holes around the canoe's stitching. The sealant is referred to as gum or pitch. It's made from the sap of a spruce tree. Um, it can also be made from pine tree, and it's sticky, it oozes out. Like this is spruce gum, so when you go to the spruce trees, like yeah, you'll find these little chunks on there, like little boogers or whatever. Then you just scrape them off. It's like the blood of the tree, and just like when you get cut, you bleed and that blood hardens and becomes a scab. That's what happens to these conifer trees like pines and spruces. When the tree has a wound, it bleeds that, that pitch out and it's sticky and it hardens up and over time, it protects that wound. The pitch is actually uh, antibacterial and antiseptic. It kills germs and bacteria. When we were do, mixing our pitch, we had a couple of people on our team that cut themselves with a tool and they had an open cut and they used that spruce gum like a band-aid. In the same way, we use the spruce gum on the canoe to seal up and waterproof any cuts in the bark. In order to get the spruce gum to be the right consistency, um, we cook it. What we'll be doing is refining that through um, melting this pot down. So there's, there's all that stuff in there. Um, but here's the same thing in here. So I'm just scraping it out, putting it in here to uh, heat up to uh, melt down. So going through that refining process, after we get this all heated up and melted down, we're getting off all the bark and chunks that are in there, the impurities. And there's a steam. It looks like steam or smoke coming off. It's actually not steam or smoke. It's vapor from turpentine. The stuff that makes pitch sticky when it comes out of trees is turpentine. And turpentine is a volatile substance. Volatile means that it is a solid or a liquid, but it will change and turn into a gas. So if we take the spruce gum and we take it right out of the tree and it's sticky, it's sticky because it's kind of liquid with a turpentine. But if we leave it over time, over the course of maybe six months to a year, just like when that pitch is on the tree, it starts to dry because the turpentine escapes as a gas or vapor into the air and it, it gets hard and brittle. So if we just put that pitch right on the canoe, at first it worked great for maybe a week or two weeks, it'd be sealed up. But pretty soon, the turpentine, we wouldn't be able to see it, it's invisible, would go off as a vapor little by little and it would become brittle and almost like peanut brittle, it would crack in little pieces and fall off the canoe. What we have to do is to keep the pitch sticky over time. So what we do is we cook it with heat and we watch as all of that turpentine sticky vapor escapes in the air. We can't have it near an open flame because it's flammable. So we cook it really slowly. When we stop seeing the vapor, we know we've cooked out most of the turpentine and we, we replace it with fat. So specifically, we use bear fat. The reason why is that average bear has about 30 pounds of fat on his body. And that fat, they store up throughout the summer and fall by eating berries and fish and other things. And it helps their body through the winter as they hibernate to be able to have food so they can survive. So it's a really readily available fat. It's also a lot more liquidy than like if you use a fat from a deer, it's, it's a solid, right? So, you know, in, at, at room temperature, it's not liquid. Yes. But, but the bear fat is liquidy, so that liquid is a... More workable. It's more workable, it's, a, it's better all the way around. So we take the bear grease and we replace the turpentine by mixing it into the hot pitch. So we add another ingredient, and that's charcoal, the black substance that's left when we burn cedar wood specifically. It's very soft charcoal. Cedar wood is burned to produce ashes that will be mixed into the spruce pitch and bear fat to make the sealant for the canoe. And we take that charcoal, which is just carbon, and we grind it up either in a mortar and pestle by hand or with a few stones, or in a modern sense, we can just put it in a coffee grinder. And so we wanna add that charcoal into our mix of fat and spruce pitch to be able to make it more doughy and take the stickiness out. In making gum, there are two different things we're trying to balance. We want it to be a little bit sticky, we want it to be a little bit flexible, but we don't want it to be too sticky. And, and there's no recipe. You know, the longer you cook the, the gum, 
every time we reheat it, we have to remix a little bit of bear fat into it and mix our charcoal and just test it until it's right. It's kind of like if your grandmother has a recipe for cookies, but she doesn't actually never wrote the recipe down. Yeah, so there's two consistencies. There's one for the inside where it's got to be a little bit more softer and then another consistency for the outside of the canoe, it's got to be just a little bit stronger. The other stuff on the inside has to be more flexible, so figuring out those, I have to figure them out both differently. So it's a lot of just going back and forth with trial and error. So We like to heat it in a cast iron frying pan. We do that because the cast iron is thick and it heats really well and it holds the heat well. We could do it in a tin can, but it'd cool off quickly. The cast iron holds the heat. So we heat it up in the cast iron, we set it on top of the canoe when the canoe is upside down, and then we grab a handful of gum. You can see how it's all sticky on my hands. Well, it won't be like that when we put it on the canoe because we'll have a, a dish of soap water, which is kind of like a very good barrier from keeping this stuff from sticking to you like this. As you can see, it becomes very, very sticky. If you don't have soapy water on your hands, or if you have a little bit of spruce gum on your hands, and you touch the spruce gum, more spruce gum will stick to you. If The things that you want to be careful of when you handle spruce gum are you don't want it on your clothing, you'll never get it out. You definitely don't want it on your hair, and if you have a beard like mine, don't get your beard in the gum. It doesn't come off of anything. It's like the ultimate sticky, messy stuff but it works amazingly well to waterproof a boat. Once the sealant cools slightly, the texture begins to change. This allows the sealant to be easily put on the canoe. The spruce pitch feels like Play-Doh or clay, and like caulk, we can push it and move it and shape it as we put it over all the cracks in the canoe. It fills the little holes, it fills the cracks, and it, it's like, like a black caulk. Once we have it on, we go back and we heat it. That's really important. Now, today we can use a heat gun to, to warm it up or a hair dryer or any number of things, even a torch. In the old days, the way to do it was to take a burning piece of birch bark or a hot ember right out of the fire and hold it right by it to warm it. So it's a two person operation. One person warms the pitch until we see it gets liquid. The next person gets their finger wet or licks it and as it's cooling, pushes it to smooth it. And that second heating allows the pitch to really heat up right by the bark, and it adheres by heat. The mixture of spruce gum, cedar ash, and bear fat has been used for centuries as a sealant. It is the perfect material for waterproofing a canoe, basket, or other items made from natural resources found in forests around the Great Lakes. We want something which is waterproof, something which is flexible, something which is sticky. It has all those qualities. As the final sealant is applied and worked in, the team prepares to launch the canoe for the first time. Once again, Sema or tobacco is offered to the land and water. This is a, a time to give thanks to the water, to the trees, to ancestors, to everything that's made this happen today. And, uh, and for our hopes and our, our wishes for the future. And today we, we recognize our, our friends, the Wyandotte Nation, who shared this territory and were friends and allies and relatives of Anishinaabe people of this land. And it is our intention in doing this work that we're we're, we're putting this intention for this knowledge and this work to come back to the, to the Wyandotte people. And so we're, we're very honored to have Chief Ted Roll here. Even though this is a, the canoe design and the canoe of the Wyandotte Nation, there hasn't been any Wyandots who built them. Now we've had a Wyandotte who's built a Wyandotte canoe. And we get to be here to witness a Wyandotte paddle and take this canoe to the water and we understand that it's the first ripple this is the first ripple of many many waves that we hope that will come to that nation of good things of revitalization and reconnection with the land of sovereignty of the res restoration of dignity and uh and the rise of that those wyandotte people again and we encourage that and we support that as your friends yeah.
like a birthing. When we're making a, a jimon, it's like we're birthing something. We're bringing it into this world. Uh, we just achieved something which is, uh, which is very, very challenging. Um, we managed to take in a matter of about four days, manufacture a boat start to finish, a functional boat right out of the forest from natural materials. And we did that with uh, a few people that had skills and have been through this process before and a lot of people who have never touched any of these materials. And uh, I consider that to be a huge success. It's a success because we all were able to paddle this beautiful watercraft that, although it's very simple, it functions amazingly well on the water. It responds well, it's, it's a canoe, it works great. Um, it's a success as well because we've inspired people and we're producing more canoe builders and we're sharing the knowledge. I also think it's a success because we've taken a project that we could have just done in the woods by ourselves and we've made it accessible for lots and lots of students and people in general to see and to learn about these natural resources and, and why they're valuable and to think about how things have been done in the past and hopefully how things can be done in the future and to think about our impact in our personal relationship with the environment. So to me, th this has been a, a very powerful week. Um, it's been a lot of work, you know, it's a huge amount of work and I don't think anyone can really understand how much work it is unless you're here every day, all day from, you know, dawn till dark doing it. Um, but all that work is definitely worthwhile. Ted Roll, project director for the Wyandotte Nation at River Raisin National Battlefield Park,
skills for these communities very difficult. People here in the South had less access to those resources. They faced more difficult challenges in being able to maintain their culture and way of life. In many Native communities, a lot of these traditions stopped. You know, like building canoes or building lodges or, or um, you know, other things. And oftentimes they stopped because they were, they were forcibly taken from people. So um, there was a lot of ways that that happened. It happened through removal of access to land and resources. It re happened through churches that, you know, and mission programs in this area that were against the culture and prevented it. And through official government assimilation programs like boarding schools. And so there's a lot of effort to be able to put things back. So that's always my, the primary goal is, you know, by doing this work and by building these canoes, we're, we're building more canoe builders and we're building in, in native communities, native canoe builders, and that's what we want to see. And, and really, I hope that, you know, we have representatives from multiple nations here, you know, like most of our crew is Potawatomi and Ojibwe, but, you know, we have representatives here from the Wyandotte Nation, we have representatives from the Miami Nation who also historically built these canoes. And from my understanding that, in those communities, in those tribes, you know, it, it hasn't been done for a long time. So, you know, my hope is that, you know, we're building more canoe builders who are going to have that connection to the land and the knowledge to carry this forward. I, I think it's important to bring it back. All of that knowledge was lost. But, but what Kevin and Frank and all of these folks down there, what they're doing is they're bringing it back and they're teaching they're, whoever wants to learn. I really see that Anishinaabe community and Anishinaabe leaders and elders have a powerful voice. Really, it's a medicine that they have to have, uh, they have for their cultural perspectives to share with everyone else, to help serve as leaders, to guide us in a way. We lived with leaders. I mean, a chief, you had a chief. You had, you had a warrior chief and then you had other warriors that, that, uh, that were the hunters and the gatherers. But you just didn't do it for your individual family. You did it for the whole village or the whole tribe. I mean, that's just how we were brought up. You just take care of everybody that's, that's in your tribe or clan. We should learn from the past so we can 